Good evening, everyone. I guess I would start with, uh, my name is Jason Niemeyer. I serve the school district as a superintendent. I want to thank you so much for being here this evening. I, I can share with you, I'm not surprised, this is a tremendous crowd. It speaks to this educational school community, the fact that you are here on a beautiful evening to come and learn more about this bond issue. I'm eternally grateful that you're here uh, to hear this message. Uh, tonight is about information. Tonight is about me sharing with you uh, this master facility project and then hopefully have the opportunity to answer uh, any questions that you might have. So uh, before we begin, I do want to just recognize a few people that are in the audience here this evening. I did see uh, Mrs. Kim Gessler. Can you stand and be recognized? She's our board member. Kim is in the back. Thank you, Kim, for being here. This is Nancy Zelli is in the house. Nancy, if you could stand to be recognized. There you go in the back. Thank you for being here. Uh, I did not see Mr. Gilly. Our board president, Mary Weinhauer, is here. Mary. And then if I could just recognize, I know that Mr. Uh, Noah couldn't be here this evening, but we are going to have a heck of a time this school year trying to celebrate him every opportunity that we get because he's been working and serving this the school district for 50 years. So today, this year is 50 years of service to Brunswick School. So even though he's not here, we just recognize him. I noticed a number of the individuals that came in the room are part of our master facility plan committee. If you are a member of that committee, we are a committee of 60 strong. Could you raise your hand? I know the Ivories. Excellent. Thank you, GP. Thank you for being here. Uh, police and fire, Lieutenant Saffron's here from the Brunswick Division of fire our police so thank you Lieutenant Saffron for being here and we have our assistant uh, mayor Mr. Nick Hannick is here so Nick thank you for being here and then lastly I just want to publicly thank John Wasilko he helps to head up our beat uh, studio and runs our beat club for our students so tonight's presentation will be uh, recorded posted on YouTube for later consumption if you so choose to do that. So John, thank you very much for being here this evening. All right. So I'm hoping if all goes according to plan, I will be able to share the entirety of this message with, with you in under 60 minutes. And then hopefully we can uh, open it up for questions and answers after that. So before we begin, I wanna talk about what can you expect from this presentation this evening. First of all, I wanna share facts with you. I want to share facts about every piece and part of this plan so that you can make an informed decision. November 8th is 71 days from today. So you're going to have the next 71 days to get all of your questions answered if they, they, do, they do not get answered uh, this evening. I believe that when you give uh, people good information, they make good decisions. So it's my hope to share that good information with you this evening and then we can move forward. So I wanna be able to explain this opportunity to you. I wanna talk about uh, the impact that this project will have on our community as a whole, and then ultimately answer any questions that you have. So before I begin, I kinda of wanna give you a lens, something to think about before I start talking about all of the different pieces and parts of this project. The cost of this project, everything I'm about to share with you will cost $7.14 per $100 of home value. So as I talk about each and every part of this project, I want you to continue to go back to, wait a minute, that's $7.14 per $100,000 of home value. According to Zillow, the average cost of a home in Brunswick, Brunswick Hills is $275,000. Apply that proportion here and you're looking at under $20 a month. I wanna share that critical piece of information with you. Look, cards on the table, I know cost is important, I get that. Especially in today's economic climate, everything that's happening, and, and I'll, I'll go into that, the question is, why would you do this now? That's the, the craziest thing I've ever heard. I'll address that later, but just know that cost is important to us. And we understand uh, the importance that cost will have on our community. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit before we begin to just to get into honoring our commitment. In the fall of 2019, uh, the Board of Education uh, adopted Brunswick's current district strategic plan. 
And that plan was created by a committee of stakeholders who were charged with aligning the district goals in the four main areas. So there's teaching and learning, there's the development of the whole child, there's communication, and there's finance and facilities. And the finance and facilities um, goal specifically states that our district will maintain a sustainable and transparent financial framework to ensure district resources align with our mission and vision. There's a, there are a number of implementation strategies for that goal, but the one I want to share with you is uh, the implementation strategy for reaching this goal was to develop a comprehensive master facilities and capital plan which addresses all remaining district facilities and all major capital needs, both short and long term. Our partnership with the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission has helped us the strategic to strategically and intentionally focus on the facilities that we want for our students. So throughout, the, throughout concentrating on facilities, we do that every single year. We're really fortunate that we have the Ohio School Association uh, business officials, business manager of the year, Sam Greta. Sam, are you in the room? Sam with the wave in the back, yeah, excellent. So, you know, business manager of the year, we're really fortunate to have people like him in place where we have a proven track record as it relates to school construction and renovation. We know what we're doing when it comes to building a new school and I think we're in a building that would suggest that to be true. Another example of how we're consistently or how we have consistently uh, focused on uh, the, the facilities that we want for our students is you know, back in 2006, the voters of Medina County approved a sales tax to support schools. In 2009, the district made a significant investment by utilizing sales tax money to make improvements to our elementary buildings. We, like many other Medina County districts, took advantage of this opportunity to improve our district facilities. And those would be the additions that uh, took place at the elementary buildings. So our facilities journey. I want to share with you, uh, in 1997, there was a landmark court case, DeRolf versus the state. Basically, they were trying to see how could we fix school funding. Unfortunately, in the state of Ohio. Unfortunately, they did not fix school funding in the state of Ohio. But a byproduct of that conversation was the development of the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission. Basically, what they found through their study and through that court case is that school districts across the state of Ohio were literally crumbling to the ground. So the state stepped up. While they didn't fix the funding formula, they stepped up and said, okay, we need to concentrate on helping to support schools in the state of Ohio. And ultimately, over the past 23 years, they've invested $12.1 billion in school facilities. We are in one of those school facilities right now. So to tell a little bit about that story with the OFCC. So back in the year 2000 when the OFCC was created, all of the 614 school districts across the state of Ohio, those that were interested in learning more about how they could potentially be impacted by school funding from this, uh, from this structure, basically we engaged in an enrollment study and we engaged in a facilities assessment. They sent teams to all school districts across the state of Ohio to look at every square foot of school district property to determine what would it cost to either renovate or replace our aging school buildings. So in the year 2000, Brunswick said, we'd be interested in learning more about that. And we didn't hear anything from the OFCC for a number of years. And then in 2015, 2016, the OFCC came forward and said, we, we, we recognize that you have the second and the third worst uh, middle school facilities across the state of Ohio. We have an interest in having a conversation with you about potentially replacing your middle school. So through that process, we were fortunate. The Board of Education acted to approve a notice of conditional approval, which basically looked at entering into a relationship with the OFCC uh, to build a new middle school. There were a number of segments in that plan that I want you to be aware of. So not only did they say, yeah, you need a new middle school, but there was also a segment of the plan that uh, was earmarked towards potentially in the future building a new high school. There was also a part of the plan that related to elementary schools. I want to talk about that because I think I was misquoted somewhere along the line and I want to just make sure I kind of put that to rest. So 
What you'll find when you work with the OFCC is they like to see school districts consolidate their elementary buildings, right? So let's close three or four buildings and build one mega elementary school. You'll see districts around us, Rexville's Broadview Heights, Westlake. There are a number of school systems where they signed up to do that, but the culture here in Brunswick, we know that we value our community based schools, our neighborhood based schools. So while there is a segment of the plan that's out there, I don't foresee the culture in Brunswick changing where that would be something that we would be interested in doing. But it is a segment of our plan. And I didn't mention that earlier and somehow I got some context added to it that wasn't my intention. The, the next segment of the plan in working with our Ohio Facility Construction Commission is the plan that relates to specifically building a new high school. So 12 months ago, this, this wasn't on anybody's radar, to be completely honest with you. We got an email, Mark and I got an email in January from the OFCC and said, hey, you are a segmented district, meaning you've, you've completed or almost completed one segment of your plan. There are other segments of your plan. We would like to just check your, kick the tires, check your health. What are, what does a new facilities assessment look like for your school district? Uh, what does a new enrollment study look like for your district? So as we begin to have those conversations and talk about uh, moving, potentially moving forward with the next segment of the plan, you know, we cooperated with uh, Future Think was the group that did the enrollment study. I know that our education department worked with, um, worked with a number of folks from their organization to look like, what is the programming that we offer to all of our Brunswick High School students? What would that equate to in terms of square footage for a new building? We wanted to have a right-sized building based on the enrollment projection and based on the needs from an instructional perspective, what would that be? So here's what we know. The enrollment study told us 10 years from now, we're gonna be 500 students smaller than we are today. So to give you some context on that, 500 students is an entire grade level of students that we are gonna shrink over the next 10 years. So when we look at our facilities as a whole, we need to really look at, are we operating in a fiscally responsible manner? That's part of the conversation that I'm gonna share with you this evening as well. The other part of the conversation is when they redid the enrollment of the facilities assessment, they basically go, went back into Brunswick High School and said, all right, based on today's numbers, what would it cost to renovate a 340,000 square foot building. We know that figure is $93 million, and we'll talk about that. See, what happens when you work with the OFCC, they wanna, they have, um, they have a, they determine a ratio of what would it cost to renovate versus what would it cost to start over and build new. And if that ratio exceeds 66, 67%, then they're not even gonna entertain the idea of renovating, they're gonna want you to build new. When you think about that, like, look at the Brunswick McDon or the Brunswick Burger King. Did they renovate the Brunswick Burger King? No, they tore it down and they started new. When you look at in Medina, you drive by down uh, down Pearl Road, the Wendy's there. Did they renovate that Wendy's? No, they tore it down and they. It's more efficient uh, to build new. So, the last part of the OFCC. Uh, part of this plan that would be, again, funded to the tune of 39%. So they're gonna give us 39% of the total part of the OS, OFCC portion of this project. So that's the removal of asbestos and the demolition of Willits Middle School, Towsley Elementary School, and the existing uh, Brunswick High School, and then the building of a brand new building. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about this idea of what is a replacement versus a repair or a replacement versus a renovation? I know that a lot of the questions that I've received or things that I read online or the conversations that I have with people in our community is, is this really a need or is this a want? So I'm hoping to be able to exp express to you why I think this is a need. And I want you to view this question through two lenses. One, this lens of brick and mortar. Let's talk about the health of the current Brunswick High School facility and what, their, what its needs are. And then ultimately the other lens that I want you to uh, look through this question is how are we preparing students for the 21st century and is the, 
is the facility that we're currently doing that really meeting those needs. So, brick and mortar. So Brunswick High School was constructed in 1967 uh, in the location that we currently call the East Building or the, or the East Hall. Three years later, in 1970, there was an addition that was added on. In 1975, a separate standalone structure was built that we now refer to as the West Building. Six years later, in 1981, the center building was built uh, to connect the east and west buildings. So over a 14-year period of time, three separate structures were built, added onto, and connected together with a roof. District leadership did a tremendous job in dealing with the growing Brunswick. Uh, I don't want to be critical of the decisions that were made. Uh, they created additional structures and connected them together, which was... That's what brought us here today. But in today's world, operating uh, this way is simply ineffic inefficient. In fact, it's the most, Brunswick High School is the most inefficient building that we have in our school district. The high school is literally a quarter mile long. From end to end, it is 1,371 feet long. Uh, many of the building systems at Brunswick High School have exceeded their anticipated life expectancy. So I'm gonna tell you, talk to you about that. We have a failing heating, ventilation, and air conditioning HVAC system. The life expectancy of the boiler system that we have in the east is 40 to 45 years. Our system is 55 years old. Uh, the life expectancy of our electric univent system that's found in the west, the average life expectancy of a system like that is 30 to 35 years. Ours is 47 years old. Our students have to come to school in multiple layers because the climate changes depending on which classroom or which part of the building that you go to. That's a problem. Um, we have failing electrical systems. The average life expectancy is 35 years. Our system ranges from 41 years of age to 55 years of age. The roof, and I'll talk about the roof a lot tonight. Uh, roofing issues require, they, they require a complete replacement. We have two different roofing systems across that quarter mile of building. We have a built up roof system as well as a membrane roof system. Both of them have exceeded their life expectancy and need to re be replaced. If I were to walk you through the high school right now, there are hallways where you will see a series of garbage cans all placed together to collect the rainwater that's coming through the roof. Those garbage cans are blocking banks of lockers. We have students that have to dodge garbage cans to be able to get into their locker to get the necessary materials to go to their next class. This idea of a band-aid solution is not fiscally responsible. We talked about, okay, so what would, what would it take? What would it take to fix some of these aging systems? So here's what we know. We know that we, if we were to completely redo the HVAC system at Brunswick High School, we know the cost would be approximately $18.4 million. So $18.4 million to replace, to replace all of the HVAC. But it's kind of a domino effect, right? Because when you replace the HVAC system, you need to make sure that you have an electrical system in place that's going to support that new HVAC system. You follow me? So we also know that to replace the electrical system, it's roughly $10.5 million to do that. Oh, and by the way, when you replace the electrical system, Domino effect, we're gonna to have to replace the lights and all the ceiling tiles. We know that's around $4 million. So right there, just that alone, we're talking about $33 million just to replace an $18.4 million HVAC system. Are you following me there? So all of what I just described to you if we were to say that's the direction we want to go, we would essentially be telling the OFCC, sorry, we're not going to take your 39%, which equates to $42.6 million. We're not interested in that. Instead, the taxpayers of Brunswick, Brunswick Hills are going are gonna to pay for that. That's just the HVAC system with the electric and the lighting and the ceiling tiles. Right? So we know that there are more significant needs above and beyond just that, but that would fall completely on the taxpayer's dime. So all needed repairs cannot be done because of budget constraints. Obviously, we don't have 
at the end of our five-year forecast, we know we have about $9 million. We don't have an additional fund somewhere that has millions and millions and millions of dollars to be able to make some of these needed repairs. The other lens that I wanted to talk to you about is the teaching and learning lens. When we talk about the, the classrooms and the physical environment that we want for our 9th through 12th grade students, we're going to talk about what that looks like. So this past year, we, uh, we participated in a process called uh, Portrait of a Graduate. We, we refer to it as the Journey of a Blue Devil. You know, as a community, over 150 people came together as part of that design team. We talked about the competencies that we want for all of our Brunswick graduates, right? So we talked about critical thinking, communication, empathy, responsibility, adaptability. Those are all the things that we're looking to foster in our students. The current high school space does not lend itself to fostering those characteristics. If you walk through a high school, you will see inconsistent classroom sizes and setups that hinder our students as they attempt to collaborate, communicate, and think critically with their peers. Simply put, the current building was not designed to accommodate these crucial skills. Don't get me wrong, our teachers do a tremendous job. They do a tremendous job fostering these competencies. I just I think about what would it look like if we put them in a building much like the one we are in here where they can really focus on fostering those competencies. You know, there's a catchphrase that we use or that you may have heard in education is that if you pick up any educational magazine, you're bound to read, our education system needs to prepare students for jobs that have not yet been created. Who's heard that, right? Uh, and although it, it's kind of a common thing to say, it's really true that the pace of change in our world is unprecedented. And our job as educators is to provide our students with the skills to adapt and successfully to be successful in an ever-changing world. Our current building does not provide a physical setting to support us in this endeavor. One thing that always stands out when I bring people through the high school is the status of our science rooms. In these classrooms where innovation should run wild, our students can't use Bunsen burners because the gas doesn't work. Many of the electrical outlets do not work in the classrooms as well, and students are stuck behind movable tables. When I think about the pod concept that we created here, that came through a visioning of our entire school community. They came together and said, what do we want science instruction in the Brunswick City School District to look like? Okay, now how can we create a space to make sure the space meets those needs? When you look at our project labs across all of our, across all of our pods, those are 1,200 square foot classrooms that have sinks and storage and uh, flexible furnishings to really um, get students to collaborate. They're just conducive to that kind of learning environment. You know, the last, I'm not going to call it a lens, but the last thing I, I definitely want to share with you when I think about this as an opportunity, right, for our new high school, um, I want to talk about safety. Now, I know school safety is on everyone's mind. I know for me that couldn't ever be more true. You know, our high school is 55 years old. Safety advances have come a long way since the, the high school was first built. This opportunity to provide the most state-of-the-art safety features for our students and staff is something that this project would offer. So I want to talk to you a little bit about understanding this opportunity when we talk about our high school and the campus improvements. So I'm going to kind of just go through, right? So the building of this brand new building, it's going to be a 285,000 square foot state-of-the-art high school facility. We know that when it opens in 26, 27, we're going to have approximately 1,850 students. It will be right size for that group of kids. Uh, it's going to be energy efficient. It's going to lead to major cost savings. Uh, like the middle school, every classroom will be outfitted with technology. One of the coolest things when I bring groups through this high school and you walk into a classroom and we talk about the technology in our classrooms here are un. Every teacher has a lapel mic, so every kid in the classroom can hear that teacher. Even if, you know, when we're fostering this love of learning and it's exciting, the teacher can turn on their lapel mic and get everybody's attention. Multiple speakers in all of the ceilings. Every classroom is out, outfitted with a wireless access point. So this idea of not having enough bandwidth to meet the needs of our 21st century learners and their devices, it's never going to be an issue at this building, and it won't be at a new high school. Uh, new science classrooms with all the tools necessary for hands-on project-based learning and science labs. 
that when we have a school, when it comes to the point where we in, invite the school visioning team together to talk about what we want, I'd have to imagine that a lot of the things that you'd see at Brunswick Middle School, you'd see in the plans for the development of the new high school. Um, this idea of purposeful design spaces for the arts, you know, we have seen firsthand how a facility can impact interest in programming. Uh, we have more students at the middle school engaged in band, orchestra, and choir than ever before. Mr. Albright, am I right on that? Like it is, it is unbelievable. Now I think about the instruction that our music class, our music classes deliver. Like I was in Edwards Middle School. I got to see Gary Allen teach music in that building. And I get to see him teach music in this building. The differences are night and day. We want to have that for our high school staff. Another part of the plan for the high school, this idea of um, investing in the total, to the totality of the campus is we know we want to add some athletic enhancements to that, to that property. After the existing Brunswick High School is torn down, we know that we want to add a multi-purpose synthetic surface, right? For our marching band, so we have one of the best marching bands in the state of Ohio. They deserve a surface that, you know, they're not gonna, if you look at the field that they're currently practicing on, if you, the BPO spends hundreds and hundreds of dollars a year to bring in lighting from outside companies so that they can practice at night, let's take care of our band. They're 260 strong. And that if you've ever seen them or if you haven't seen them, I would certainly encourage you to come and see the magic that they create on Friday nights and the magic that they create when they compete. We know that we want to add six tennis courts to the high school campus. Right now, our tennis teams practice, at, uh, practice and compete in Nura Park. Uh, our school district takes on the responsibility of maintaining those courts during the season. Having our courts on our campus will promote team spirit and community. You know, these kids, these tennis kids, they, we, we have to drive them down the streets in, to Nura Park. It's not convenient for their classmates to come and cheer them on. And, and you know, a lot of school districts in the area have that luxury of having tennis courts on their campus. So we wanna, we wanna provide that for our students. We wanna add a baseball field. We wanna add uh, the baseball field to our existing campus. We'll have nothing to do with the Heron Park project. That baseball field will be left where it's at. Uh, right now we have multiple teams that have to go off site for their games and practices. Uh, and we have to maintain those, you know, those fields as well. It's just, it's, just a, it's a hardship for our school district. And honestly, it's a safety concern to have kids competing and practicing off of our campus. So really, we're, our interest is making sure that we utilize our campus and we keep our students on our property. Another part of the opportunity is uh, site improvements to elementary school. So I'm going to tell you about this. With the closing of Towsley Elementary School, which I'll talk about, we know that we have 313 students that are in that building currently. At the end of the 22-23 school year, we know we're going to close that building. We also know that the lion's share of those students are going to go to Huntington, Applewood, and potentially a small pocket over to Kidder Elementary School. We know that we want to add four classrooms to Applewood. We know that that's gonna provide us with the flexibility in that building to be able to deal with fluctuation in enrollment. We also know that we wanna put a parking lot over at Applewood. It is, if you've ever been anywhere near Applewood at the time of arrival or dismissal, here's what, you know, here's what I know you will see. You will see hundreds of cars of parents trying to take their children to school and drop them off, right? Because in today's day and age, a lot of parents, that's their opportunity to have a conversation with a child before they drop them off for the day, right? But we have hundreds of cars coming in and out of Applewood. We also have nine school buses that are coming in and out of the same spot. Oh, and by the way, any child that lives within a mile of Applewood Elementary School are having to walk to Applewood. There are no sidewalks in that area. So we have hundreds of cars, nine buses, and lots of kids. It's just from a safety perspective, that makes me nervous. But what I'd like to propose as part of this project is we build a 72-spot parking lot on the Applewood property. We'd be able to separate our bus traffic and our parent traffic. We'd be able to get the buses in and out safely. You know, Applewood, in the Brunswick City School District, we value family engagement. 
I can tell you if you try to go to a family engagement night, whether it be a literacy night or bingo or any of those awesome experiences that the PTO, PTG, PTA provides over at Applewood, there are cars parked all over the grass, three and four deep, just from a safety perspective. And I see people shaking their head because you know what I'm talking about, right? It's a, it's a problem, it's a concern. This would provide our community the opportunity to invest in some site enhancements to really improve one of our best assets, Applewood Elementary School. Additionally, we want to add five classrooms to Kidder Elementary School. Same, kind of the same story. We want to add a parking lot. We want to separate the preschool traffic from the school age parent traffic, from the bus traffic. And we want to add parking spots. Who in here has ever driven down Drafton Road between 8 and 8.05 a.m.? Right? It's a parking lot. It's a parking lot, and it simply takes one bus or one car to be turned or over just, just slightly so much in the parking lane, and it's a complete shutdown, and people can't get anywhere. What we'd like to do is fix that. We'd like to be able to add entry into a parking lot, separate the buses, and separate our preschool uh, traffic. Additionally, why do we need classrooms over there, over at Kidder? Here's the situation. At Kidder, that's where we house our preschool. I can tell you that preschool law, or preschool expectations from the Ohio Department of Education have changed significantly, right? So we have child find where we're identifying students who have disabilities as early as age three. The school district is required to serve those students. And not only are we required to serve them, but we're also required to abide by ratios of students, like typical peers, special education students, and you can have so many of this population of students, so many of that population of students, and the, it seems like the rules and regulations change every single year. By adding those five classrooms over at Kidder, that's gonna provide us with the flexibility to meet the needs of our youngest learner, learners over at Kidder. So again, parking lots and classroom additions at Applewood and Kidder. The next part of the plan would be uh, the building a new board of education and moving the maintenance department. So this is the question I get every time I say this, and I welcome it, right? Because I want to be completely and fully transparent with you. Here's what I get. Why don't you just stay where you are? Yeah, okay, we looked at that. We thought, that's a great idea. Let's talk about what it would look like to stay exactly where we are. So in order to stay where the board office currently is, if we were to knock down the existing Brunswick High School, and build a little wall, right, to seal it up. Here's the issue with that. We know that it would cost $6.8 million to do that. That's a significant amount of money. Why would it cost that much money? Well, we get all of our electricity from the board office, or from the, from the high school. We get all of our water. We get all of our HVAC. So basically everything that helps us to operate over at the board office would have to be redone reconstruct it. It cost $5 million to build a brand new board office that's the right size. We know based on our needs, based on the program that we offer, we would need a structure of approximately 13,200 feet, square feet. So it doesn't make sense to stay in the current 21,000 square foot structure that we would have to spend $6.8 million to be able to be to be able to make it so it can stand on its own. So we talked about that. The other question that I get uh, quite a bit is, okay, why not just move into Willits? That's a really good question. We did consider that. So Willits Middle School is a middle school. It is 72,000 square feet, of which 19,000 square feet of that building is sinking into the ground. Why, if our needs are 13,000 square feet for a new board office, why would we put the board office in the 72,000 square foot structure? It doesn't make sense. What we also know through our work with the Ohio Facility Construction Commission is that to bring that building up to OFCC specs, it would cost approximately $23 million. That's just to bring it up to OFCC specs. That's not something that we're interested in doing. We could build four board offices for that amount of money. 
The other part of the project that we want to focus on is the, the moving of the maintenance department. Here's what we know. We know that the new high school is 285,000 square feet. We know that the footprint of the new high school would situate almost on top of, but very close to the existing maintenance department. We feel that it's in the best interest of the new high school, the traffic flow that will be created around that high school, and basically for our maintenance department to move them to the, where Will's property is right now. Move them to the back of the campus and provide them with the, the resources that they need so they can continue to take care of all of our uh, school facilities across the district. So while we explored and gave consideration to how can we repurpose or reutilize Willits, just the cost factor alone, it just doesn't make sense. So that is the total package of the facilities master plan. So I wanna circle back really quickly, right? What will this plan for $7.14 a month on a $100,000 home, under $20 a month for the average taxpayer in Brunswick, Brunswick Hills, look at what this project will bring to our students. Will provide us with optimal learning environments for our high school students, the, the kids that are going off into careers and college, we're providing them an environment that's gonna ready them for the future. I just think about the return on investment there is pretty amazing. Uh, we'll be able to provide a transformative student experience for our students. When I look at the safety and security, not only of the safety enhancements that we would have at the high school, but I look at the safety enhancements just from a parking perspective and a traffic flow perspective at Kidder and Applewood. I, I'm excited at that, the, the significance of that impact. And lastly, this, I mean, this is a proactive, when you talk about strategic, transparent, responsible spending, this is a proactive attempt to, to get away from the Band-Aid approach. I, mean, I think about at our high school, we had, we had a compressor go down in our HVAC system two weeks ago. It's a $20,000 expense to fix that. $20,000 to fix uh, 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 an HVAC system that has already exceeded its life expectancy. We want to, again, the Band-Aid approach is not working. This is an opportunity for us to invest in the future. I wanted to be sure, and you know, part of this conversation this evening, and I know we sent out a questionnaire to, to folks, and we had 22 people respond, and I want to thank you for that. One of the questions that came back over and over again is they want to talk about Towsley. I want to talk about Towsley too. Let's, let's have that conversation. We feel like we're in a position where we need to right size our, our school district. We know the outcome of the enrollment study specifically stated that we're going to be 500 students fewer in 10 years. So what do we do with that information? Well, we, we have to act. Uh, the enrollment decline from a, from a long-term perspective, how can we make well, how can we take action now to make sure that we're doing the fiscally responsible thing in moving forward? The short-term uh, Towsley story that I want to address is the, the fact that I want to take you back to the operating levy of 2021. Many of you in the room would remember that it took us four attempts at the ballot, right, to pass new operating dollars. We were finally successful in May of 2021. The, the part that people need to understand or realize is that prior to that levy, we were forced by the Ohio Department of Education to say, hey, your five-year forecast shows that you're gonna be in the red to the tune of $3.5 million. So our treasurer, Mark Papera, had to put together a plan to say, how are we going to address this? Because you can't just say, well, we're not gonna do anything about it, right? We're not gonna go swirl into the, the world of debt. So the first thing that we do is we say to the state, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pass an operating levy. And that hopefully would take care of that $3.5 million deficit that we were looking at. But that's not good enough for the state, rightly so. The state wants us to submit a plan. So we got together, Mark and I and the team, and said, okay, what would this plan potentially look like? I, can, I have the graphic, I can share it with you. 
the state required reduction of planning and spending to the tune of $3.5 million that was submitted to the state. Here's what that document entailed. We were gonna cut all busing to state minimums. In the state of Ohio, state minimums are two miles. In the Brunswick City School District, we, we operate at a one mile radius to the building, but the state minimums are two miles. We were gonna, at the time, not restore high school busing. So you remember, we had to cut high school busing as part of a previous plan to kind of take care of the budget concerns that we had. This idea of, we knew we were gonna ask for the amount of millage that was gonna help us to be able to re-institute high school busing, which we're really happy that we were able to do. Uh, but at that point, we were gonna have to say, no, we're not gonna be able to do that. We knew that we were gonna have to eliminate approximately 70 jobs. We knew that we were gonna have to eliminate and or reduce extracurriculars and clubs. We knew that we were gonna have to eliminate early bird classes for the middle school students. What's an early bird class? So this building opens about an hour early every single day and we have about 270 students who come into this building and get foreign language instruction prior to the start of their school day. Something that's very unique to Brunswick, a lot of school districts just say, uh, if you're gonna offer it at the high school level, do it during the middle school day, but no. It's a really nice feature for our middle school kids. We knew that was something that we were gonna have to cut. We knew that class sizes were going to increase. We also knew that we were gonna have to eliminate middle school academic teams. We weren't even completely into this building at that point. We're operating what's best for kids right now. The structure that we have at the middle school, the pod concept, the, 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 the team within a building concept that we have, we knew that we were gonna to have to cut that and go to more of a junior high uh, type schedule in order to save that money. So thankfully that didn't happen. But the last thing on that list was the permanent closure of an elementary building and having to redistrict. So yes, that was stated, that was part of our plan. Thankfully, we were successful in May of 2021 and we did not have to institute that plan. But here we are, down the road, we come across this new information, this new enrollment study information. We can't look taxpayers in the eye and say we're operating in a fiscally responsible manner. We can't do it. Towsley Elementary School is approximately 61,000 square feet. If we were operating that building, at, that building at capacity, we'd have 577 students in that building. Today, we have 313 kids in that building. Nine years ago, we had 531 kids in that building. That's a 41% reduction in student enrollment at Towsley alone over a nine year period. We can't look taxpayers in the eye and say, we're operating in a fiscally responsible manner and continue to operate a half full building. So regardless of whether we're successful on a bond issue over the next 13 months, whether in May, 71 days from today, regardless of our success or failure, we have to do the right thing, which is to close Towsley Elementary School. And there's a lot of emotion with that, right? I was there two weeks ago. I got to meet with the 60 staff members over at Towsley. Claire, I mean, that was one of the hardest conversations I've ever had to have in my 25 years in education, because people love their building, and I get it. People absolutely love that building. And they have a proud history there. C.R. Towsley, if you know this, he was the first superintendent of the Brunswick City School District. It's a big deal, right? Bill Parshan, I never had the opportunity to meet Bill Parshan. He died 23 years ago. But I can tell you, any person that I've ever met who said I knew Bill Parshan, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is that guy was the nicest guy on the planet. We want to honor that. We want to keep that memory of Mr. Parshan. We want to keep the memory of Mr. Towsley. We, Kathy and I were over in the front yard at Towsley counting all of the bricks that created the memorial for uh, Mr. Parshan, and we fully intend to work with the Historical Society to say how can we continue to honor his memory? What would that look like? So we've had, we're starting to have some of those conversations because it's important. It's important to honor our past. It's also important for us to consider building for our future. All right, so what's next? The next part is we're gonna have high school tours on tours uh, on September 14th and September 21st at 7 p.m. 
So we're going to get information out via social media, through Facebook, through Twitter, through uh, school newsletters, to the general community. Madison, I see you're here from the Gazette. Madison's going to help us get the word out through the Gazette, hopefully, that we want to invite as many people who are willing to come to the high school. We'll meet at the PAC. We'll have a quick conversation. And then I want to walk you around the high school and show you uh, show you that environment. And then you can draw your own conclusions of whether you believe uh, we need a new high school for our, for our high school students. Additionally, we're going to have community engagement opportunities. Uh, the Google Doc that Mrs. Eller created where you can submit your questions, we're going to continue to put that out there and field those questions. We're in the development of a frequently asked question portion of our website, so we can direct people to those FAQs to answer those questions. There's also going to be a facilities part of our website to help kind of tell our story. I think that's where the link to the video for this evening's presentation will be at as well. So we're continuing to work to identify those additional opportunities to engage our community. Time is of the essence, like I keep saying, we have 71 days between today uh, and November 8th. So now we're gonna transition into the question part of this conversation. Again, I'd like to thank the 22 to 25 people that did leave us questions. You know, we did have the opportunity to address many of the questions that we had um, through this presentation and helped us, right? Mrs. Cucarola Brown, your uh, presentation during the public comment portion of the board meeting really helped us put some perspective on the, the story that we're trying to tell. So I'd like to publicly thank you for your comments because that was very helpful. Uh, so there were definitely some themes that uh, were put through that, through that Google Doc. One of the questions was, what is the difference between an operating levy and a bond issue? I can tell you in all of the years that I've worked in public education, trying to explain how we fund schools in the state of Ohio is very challenging. Operating versus renewal versus bond issue versus sales tax, it's always an uphill battle. So I guess the easiest way to answer this question is bond levies are different than operating levies in that the money raised can only be used for capital purposes, like construction. And that's the bond issue is what we're talking about tonight. Bond levy money cannot be used for salaries or other operating expenditures. They're restricted funds. When you talk about operating levies, those are the monies that raise sufficient funds to help operate this school district. Salaries, equipment, those kinds of things to help operate a school system. The next question is, uh, why would you put a bond issue on the ballot right now? Timing's great, isn't it? Is this timing is just absolutely awesome. So, I mean, elephant in the room, and transparent, I'm gonna be transparent with you. Elephant in the room. Yeah, we're aware that property values in Medina County have increased. We're aware of that. Does that help us? Not necessarily, but at the same time, let's, let's unpack that a little bit. So, first of all, it wasn't our choice. Yeah, when they sent us the email, we said, we're interested in hearing what you have to, to say in the next segment of our plan. Fast forward six months and all of a sudden, we're, we're approving to, to move forward, to go on the ballot in November. But this 13 month window that the OFCC to raise the local share, 61% of the local share, we have 13 months to do that. So the question I get is, well, what happens if you're not successful? That's a really, really good question. So here's what happens if you're not successful. You become what's known as a lapsed district. If you become a lapsed district, you go back onto the list, and there's no guarantee of when they're gonna call your number again. But it's really interesting. There were only five school districts across the state of Ohio this year that were selected to receive funds from the Ohio Facility Construction Commission. One of those five districts was a lapsed district. Back in 2004, they were not successful in raising their local share, and they became a lapsed district. And then over the course of the next, I think it was 14 years, they worked with their community to talk about why it would be a really good idea to continue to entertain the idea of working with the OFCC to raise the local share, and then they were successful. I want to say they were successful in 2018. They were successful in raising that share. They reached out to OFCC, 
said, hey, we were able to raise the local share. And then six years later, four years later, they were named this year as one of those groups. So I don't know that Brunswick High School has 18 years that we can gamble with that bet, but I'm just, full transparency, that's how, when you work with the OFCC, here's what I know for sure, there are no guarantees. So I'll leave it at that. So here's what we know, home values would increase straight from the auditor. The auditor states that while home values will go up approximately 20 27%, the resulting taxes will not. We got, we got permission to be able to say that. The general rule of thumb for every 10% increase in value, it results in approximately 2% increase in taxes. Uh, you, you referenced there was a great article in the Medina Gazette about this topic. Madison, nice job. So I would continue to, to look at what does that mean for me? My taxes went up 30%. The portion of your taxes would increase potentially 6%. So it, at that point, I think I'm, I think I'm gonna leave this one alone. So at this time, we're gonna open things up for audience questions. If you have a question that you would like to ask, I would ask that you raise your hand. And Kathy's gonna come over, and I'm gonna do my best job to try to answer the question that you have. And if I can't do it, if it's a financially related question, our treasurer CFO is in the audience. Anybody have any questions? I was gonna say, wow, I really, like really covered all the bases there, awesome. I've got a couple of them, do you want oh. me to ask them all? How about we go one at a time? Um, so the first question I have is, uh, did the school district consider um, an income tax levy that would exempt uh, retirement and social security income as opposed to a bond? Um, and if so, was there any cons uh, determination of maybe what kind of uh, tax that would need to be, like a 1%, 2%? Lots of other districts have that in the state, mixed reactions and responses. But I do know some districts in other parts of the state where there was reluctance to pass a levy due to the aging population had some success with that. That's a great question for our treasurer. It's <laughs> <laughs> a, a great question. Mark, you're on the hot seat. There you go. Yep. <laughs> Am I oh, good. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, we have looked at uh, income tax levies um, in, as an alternative to the traditional levies in the past. Most school districts, when you pose the income tax levy, the, the biggest issue you face, the biggest hurdle you face, besides obviously gaining uh, ultimate approval for that levy, is the senior uh, situation. As incomes, obviously, at that stage in individuals' lives, usually on a fixed type income, they're very concerned about those. There are school district, there is a school district income tax that has some exemption permissions. Um, however, those types of levies, um, the income tax amount that you would have to levy traditionally is higher to cover for that. Um, they don't tend to be as popular. Um, if you, uh, and we did some research on this at the state of Ohio. I, years ago, I was part of a school district that had an income tax, very unique community, but there's a very small minority in Ohio that traditionally lay, uh, raise operating monies through income tax. Um, using an income tax to support a capital issue um, is not very typical. That would be kind of unusual. And in our particular circumstance where we have 13 months in order to raise the local share. Um, we also consider the viability of, you know, this community has never had an income tax levy for schools. We have a sales tax, obviously, in Medina County. That takes education. It takes a lot more sessions than one or two in a community to explain that to all the constituents so they understand it. You get that level of trust and then ultimately, hope, hopefully, you gain the support. So. Um, Obviously, the mo or not obviously, but the most economical way and the lowest cost is to uh, petition the voters through a bond issue. Um, 
we can stretch the bond issue out. There's a mathematical equation that allows us to stretch the bond issue out. It's based on the project you're intending to build. So the more bricks and mortar in the project, the longer you can finance that issue, obviously. It's just like similar to building your, your home. You have a 30-year mortgage, we're able to do something very similar with the bond issue. You can stretch that bond issue. This particular bond issue would be, would be uh, the duration would be 37 years. So, yep, absolutely. Um, do you have any information from the county auditor about how the bond levy would affect residents that are currently receiving their homestead exemption? Were there, will their taxes increase the same rate or not at all? Um, how does that affect them? The, the homestead exemption for any new levies has been, uh, uh, the, has been eliminated. Um, there is a, um, a new homestead exemption, I think it was $20,000, $25,000 threshold. That will still be in tax, so that will have no negative effect on this proposed uh, bond issue. I think it could help people to understand that, that, that might be a good point. Very good. Um, and realistically, in 13 months, how many bites at the apple do you think you have possibly? Like, what are the, how many times could you possibly, worst case scenario, need to go back to the ballot mm -hmm. if we have to go back more than once? How many times do we have to do that in 13 months? So the optimistic side of me would say that we're gonna do such a good job telling our story and informing our community that they're gonna look at this like, wow, this is a no-brainer. But here's the answer to the question. I don't, have a, I don't have a crystal silver ball. I don't have a crystal ball. I can tell you this though. The, the leadership of our school board will come into play where we look at the results in November and then we have conversation about what we think is the next, the just right next step. I just didn't know if, the, if there was only certain periods of time that you were able to call a special election. So here's what we know. We know November 8th is 71 days away from today. We know that May, I think it's May 3rd, 2023, is a couple hundred days away from today. Uh, if we're not successful in those two, there's potentially a special one election in August. That's really hard. Sure. Special election is a, is a significant challenge. And again, I can't speak for the board. All I can say is that they're gonna really sink their teeth into what's the best, the best next step for our school district. Wonderful, and I have one more question, and that's based on the enrollment figures. Yes. Could you explain a little bit more about how that forecast is, is you know, how they did that, and yeah. how do all these new developments that are coming in that seem to make sense that it would be for families how is that offsetting with maybe where we're losing population? That's a great question. I asked the same. I asked the same one because when we received the results of the enrollment study, we were looking at it and we're like, "This can't be right." There's a couple of things. They work with the city of Brunswick, Brunswick Hills. We work with birth year data. We work with uh, the enrollment study that we look at over the course of the last 10 to 20 years across Brunswick City School District. We also provide them all of the new construction, single family homes. So we share all of that information with Future Think, and then they're the ones that, that's what they do. Uh, they are accurate within 5% standard error 90% of the time. So they have a really good track record for being really close. You know, we joke about this, but when we were on the when we were on the phone with Tracy Healy, we were like, Tracy, we were told that during COVID, there was going to be this population boom because everybody was stuck in their home. And what, what we found out was that was not happening at all during COVID. So, so that, was, that was not a thing. But, you know, I mean, we, we want... I joke, like when we have an open house or I see a family that comes in with two or three or four children, I'm like, have more, keep them coming, we'll take them. We will take them all, uh, no matter their size, their shape, their ability, we, you know, we want, to, we want to have as many students as possible. But you know, ultimately, uh, hopefully what you got from tonight is that we also need to make sure that we are making fiscally responsible decisions. So I appreciate your questions, those were really thank you. Very much. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Horn, proud Brunswick Rotarian, hands out.
dictionaries to all of our school, all of our third graders across the school district. Thank you so much for being here. Please ask a question for the treasurer. <laughs> well, uh, my first question is in regards to um, you know the decision on Towsley uh, and what kind of impact does that have on the operating levy? Uh, the, how, you know, does it elongate the the viability of that uh, current operating levy? And then my follow-up question is, are you guys looking at any of the um, infrastructure or IT that currently resides in Towsley to be able to utilize that in other facilities? Those are my two questions. Very good question, and I want to apologize because I'm going to take a step back to that conversation. I'll finish the story. So when we met with those 60 staff members over at Towsley, Here's what we know. We know that we have 313 students at Towsley. We know that they're going to have to go to a new location. We also know that they're going to need to be taught in that new, new location. It's not like those 60 people are going to be reduced or reduction in force or let go. We're absolutely committed to the best of our ability to do everything in our power to hold those staff members safe and moving forward. I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. It's not like we're closing the building. Good luck. Uh, we're committed to our staff and committed to making sure that they're held harmless to the best of our ability. Now to answer your question specifically, Mr. Horn, here's what we think we know. We know that from a utilities perspective, where we look to potentially save across the school district with the, with the closing of Towsley, potentially approximately $90,000 a year in operating expenses from a utilities perspective. And then as far as the technology that's in the infrastructure at Towsley, to be honest with you, it, like all things technology, the minute you take it out of the box, it's, it's already expired, it's already extinct. But I can tell you this, we have a committed technology department that's gonna look at every single server, every single access point, every piece of technology in that building to see if it can be reused in another location across the district. And thank you for your service to our third graders, Mr. Horn. Appreciate it. My pleasure. I have a couple of questions. First off, on the operating levy that you mentioned that is already in place, have you looked at how much money we're going to get off of the current uh, rate going up? If, if uh, everybody's property values goes up 27%, you're at a fixed rate off of that for that operating levy. So is that going to increase enough money that you won't have to run another? Operating levy? I can probably take that one. I want to say House Bill 920, but you can say it. Go ahead. So there's a couple things. Um, one of the misnomers is we have uh, most of the millage in the school district is voted levies. The community voted in millage to support our schools. When property values increase, there is a uh, law that was put on the books back in the 70s when inf inflation was run running rampant. It's called House Bill 920. A lot of you have heard either me speak about it, former treasurer speak about it, or superintendent at meetings like this. Essentially what that means is as property values increase in our community, the auditor actually rolls back the millage rate on those levies. So you pay less on each one of those voted levies. Now a lot of folks don't either understand that or see that because a lot of folks pay their taxes in with their mortgage payment. It's paid to an escrow company. They don't, a lot of people honestly don't even look at their tax bills. You can look at your tax bills. You can go right on the auditor's website if you're interested and, and, and some folks do and they've had these questions over the years. So essentially um, as the property values increase, they roll back the millage rate. The only amount of inflationary increase the schools obtain is a very small amount of millage. We have 40 some effective mills levied here in Brunswick for our schools. Only 4.9 mills of that total amount of millage levied for our schools is not subject to House Bill 920. So as a result of the increase, um, the, the, I, I think the auditor, if I referenced him correctly, said about 27% increase. So, I did the math on that. That'll generate about $1.4 million for the school district. 1.4, just to put that in context, $1.4 million is less than 1% uh, less than of our overall budget or our annual spend. So we do recognize we will receive that, but I should tell you that there's no surprise that property values are looked at by the auditor 
they typically look every three years. There's what's called a update, a reappraisal cycle, which we are in now. And then in another three years, they do a six year look back period at all the property values. I anticipate that when I provide our financial forecast for the district, for the board. So I've already anticipated we likely would have seen some sort of increase during this time period. So I've accounted for that in our operating uh, projection. So when we proposed the last operating levy, I did estimate some sort of increase for this upcoming appraisal as well as in another three years as well. So that's already been factored in. That amount of money would not generate enough to cover the debt service on this. So it's, it, it, it really, um, in addition to not covering that debt service, I've already factored it into our financial, for our operating needs. So it's like robbing Peter to pay Paul on that. On that. I didn't assume that it was, would be money to be used for this. I'm more worried about, I mean, obviously, there are two things that are most important here. Teaching our kids, which is our teachers, and making sure our kids are safe. Um, so, but if, if we're gonna pay for a bond issue here and then have to come right back with a, a levy for operating expenses, and I see already from the projections that you guys are looking at as far as adding to school buildings and the trouble you're having with traffic, Medina County, especially Brunswick, is gonna be forced to put in more sidewalks. Otherwise, the safety of our children will become more and more of a question. And if you're gonna do that, the city's gonna go back to a, a bond issue. Or else they're gonna charge a specific amount to each homeowner that's gonna have those sidewalks put in. So there's, there's multiple questions here about how to spend the money. I fully understand how you presented this, and my biggest question is because on my street, half of the people, half of the families are on Social Security for a limited budget. And all of them are gonna have, whether they make this happen or not, and sooner or later, they're gonna be forced to pay for sidewalks and some other things to accommodate the schools. So the questions you're answering here are not everything that people need to know. And people are thinking about it. I'm gonna be honest with you, we've already had a meeting on our street. Were that many of us are retired already and on a, on a, a limited income? We're not sure we're getting everything we need to from the city. I've lived here for 47 years. My daughter's graduated from Brunswick. I have never, ever not voted for something that the schools wanted. I hate to tell you, but the most majority of my friends and the people on my street are going to vote against it. Strictly because of the dollars it's going to cost them. This is the wrong time to be doing it. And I'm sorry, I understand, you're forced into this situation. But people are being serious about money right now. The way inflation is going up, well, I can, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, no, no, you don't have to apologize. I certainly appreciate your comments. Um, what I can tell you to kind of go along with the, the question you asked is, you know, in assuming these reappraisal increases, and while it's a relatively small amount compared to our total operating budget, it will help to extend us. I can tell you, I know you mentioned the concern is, well, if we're proposing a bond issue now, are you gonna come back in another year or two for additional operating dollars? That is not in our forecast. We've leveraged as is, is, is many of, we were provided some federal funds that helped offset some of our expenditures. We had our schools in a virtual environment for a certain period of time, which helped achieve economies. That has helped lengthen our financial outlook. Um, the, so as far as an operating levy is concerned, that is not on the near time horizon. We provided a commitment to our taxpayers when we passed this last operating levy. At a minimum, this was gonna last five to six years. I believe it will be longer than that. It's just as a financial officer, I obviously, my, my major concern is the 7,000 students we educate on a daily basis, or six, six to 7,000 students on a daily basis. I need to be responsible to our taxpayers as well. I can't allow our school district to, to get into a dire situation or a surprise situation. Um, but, but my estimation with my current forecast is we are going to be fine for the near future. So I, I, can, I can honestly say here, as your fiscal officer, we are not gonna be on the ballot in two years for operating money. Um, so. 
hopefully that answers some of your questions, but I understand your concern. According to what we think the plan would, would entail, uh, we would look at opening the new high school in the 26 27 school year. The footprint of the new 285,000 square foot high school will sit over the top of where Towsley Elementary School currently resides. So we will be able to utilize the existing Brunswick High School for the next, for the foreseeable future until that building is built and ready to go. And then when we open in 26, 27, we would open our doors to approximately 1,850 students. Great question. As the school district done a calculation of the housing affordability threshold, uh, because as the gentleman said here, you know, people are being you know, taxed this increase, how is that going to affect the housing affordability threshold where people are basically going to be taxed out of their homes with an increase? That's a great question for our treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think what, what we've done is we've, we have obviously a plan. We've put a dollar figure to that, that plan. We've tried to make the most fiscally responsible plan, not only looking at the immediate opportunity that the state has presented us, but also as Superintendent Niedermeyer mentioned, we're looking at everything district-wise. We really want to finish up the master facilities plan at the most cost-effective way for, for the residents in our community. We could choose to isolate the biggest portion of the plan, which would be the new high school. But I think that would be a little foolish not to consider all the long-term needs because I think extending those uh, or waiting to pursue those opportunities instead of now will cost a lot more. I can tell you we had information on our assessment data. Literally 18 months ago, the costs have gone up 20%. Now, will that trend continue? I don't know. In the near future, it could. We're still, as a school district, I can tell you, experiencing supply chain disruptions. We're seeing inflationary increases in our supplies, materials, even equipment costs above and beyond just delays. And vendors obviously can use that to their advantage, some of them. We have good relationships with a lot of others that are working through that with us, but it still costs us more to operate. So we're, we're, we're trying to, uh, respond to our issues, whether it be safety and security, whether it be our long-term needs of our facilities, and trying to do that in the most economical manner. And we believe this plan accomplishes that. We understand what's going on in the economy now today, but I, I hate to make comparisons to other school districts, but there are other school districts in the area with a plan very similar to ours, about $100 million, there's one $200 million. The millage amount for that plan and the cost for that plan is triple what we're talking about here. So I, I can tell you as your fiscal officer, we have a real value here in Brunswick. One is obviously the size of our tax base. So we can do a lot um, from a cost perspective for, for a little cost versus some other communities that in order to accomplish the things we're talking about would be very costly. Great question. Thank you, Dakota. Any other questions? Mr. Horn. Sorry. Um, just a, and I apologize if you may have addressed this. I was tardy. Um, has, was there any consideration or looking into uh, collaborating with uh, the city uh, in regards to maybe a Wadsworth Medina model? you know, rec center, high school, combination um, facility similar to that? I guess I would say this, Mr. Horn, and, and you've been in the room, we, we have worked very hard to strengthen and establish 
a continued relationship with the city. I know I'm, I have conversations with Mr. Hannock, with Mr. DeForest. We've worked through some of the, you know, through some issues together and tried to strengthen those opportunities. We have not specifically had conversations about this particular project with the city at this point. Good question. You've mentioned about the new school being more efficient, and obviously I understand that a lot of that comes with having new things, right? An old system is antiquated, it takes a lot of funds and whatever to run. Are you, with this plan, looking to, looking even further into the future, keeping that efficiency with solar panels, water use reduction, anything like that, or is it just based on a standard building at this point in time? When you, one of the benefits to partnering with the state on these types of construction projects, and we had a similar situation here, they require you to obtain a certain level of LEED certification. So it goes to the things you're speaking about, energy conservation, water conservation, and so on and so forth. So we are trying to obtain silver status for this building here. We believe, according to tonight, I was talking to one of the representatives, we believe we're almost at the end of that process and we hope to achieve that. So we will be incorporating a number of those things in the design, which long term will obviously provide operational savings. Because once we build the building, it's all we can use that money for, right? And then we will be supporting that building with our operational budget, just like we do the rest of our buildings. So we wanna, we wanna operate at the lowest effective cost we can while obviously providing the education for our students. Sorry if you covered this. I think I paid attention most of the time. Um, I heard you say 30 some million for a few systems that are on borrowed time. That like literally could go, I shouldn't even speak it out loud, but like could go next month kind of a thing. Don't say that. Is, is, um, what do you know a ballpark of like if all the systems that are really on borrowed time, like borrow, borrow time, like what that number is? Sorry if I missed that. You no, 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 that's a great question. So when you engage in a relationship with the OFCC, they look at cost of rebuild versus cost of renovation. We know the total cost to bring the existing 340,000 square foot high school, to bring that up to OFCC standards would cost $93 million to do that. And they provide us with a, and we're gonna post the, we will be posting the, the facilities assessment information on our website. It is. It makes for great reading if you're trying to fall asleep. Um, it will go in and show you specifically every building system and the needs that it would take to renovate to bring up to OFCC specs. Great question. I'm just. I'm wondering of the things that could go wrong quick. Yes. How does that stack up to the whole amount you need? Because you're in a bad time frame now to get this through, but you're also going to be in a bad time frame when something is demanded of you. Yep. So it's a good point. We're thankful, like, you know, we have members of our maintenance department here, Mr. Kelly, who leads that department, they do a tremendous job. Our staff are unbelievable. So between maintenance and custodians, we do everything in our power to, we've been using, unfortunately, the band-aid approach. So hopefully we're not in a position where it's you know, that dire where we need to find $33 million to put in a new HVAC system, the electric, electrical system to support that HVAC system, and then lighting and ceiling tiles. Well, and you know, just, just to... Yeah. Just, just, that, just, to add, just to add on to that, though, to think about it, and that's a great question, but to think about it, Regardless of which area Jason spoke about, and he quoted the three numbers for HVAC, electrical, lighting, so on and so forth, to raise millions of dollars, we, we honestly do not have that in our annual spend or our ability. What would we have to do then if, God forbid, that happened? We would have to go out and issue debt. Now, keep in mind that debt would be at 100% of our cost. And what we're talking about here is issuing debt but having the state pick up 39% of the tab. So 
we've considered that obviously that's a great question but that's some of the long-term financial thinking that has gone into this piece to, you know in contrast to that thanks Alex the question So the total OFCC part, the state funded part, is about $109.5 million, of which they're going to pick up 39% of that cost, so they'll essentially write us a check for $42.6 million. Great question. So as we finish up our conversation this evening, I just want to say this to you. Mrs. Aller, our community relations per person, will go out of her way to make sure that we are continuing to flood our Facebook, our webpage, our social media accounts. If you go, if you leave this room this evening and you have a thought or a question that you want to have answered, I would certainly encourage you to please use that Google Doc and give it to us because we want to make sure that we inform the community. We want to give you as much information as possible so that you can make an informed decision 71 days from today. So at this point, I want to thank you very much for being here this evening. And at any point, feel free to reach out with additional questions, okay? Thank you very much.